there's a part of my brain that's like, I can't believe I'm talking about Meghan Markle. <laughs> From Dane's Policy, I'm Charlene. I'm Crispin. And this is our week in review. Uh, basically, Dane's Policy is a platform and an intelligent people like yourself where you talk about interesting ideas. I've lost the plot. <laughs> well, it's okay. I mean, at some point, uh, not yet, I'll wait till we get to our thousand mark before we change it up too much, but I, I probably will drop the intelligent bit of our introduction. What? because Well, because I think... Everybody who listens to this is intelligent. One, one of the great... Uh, well, that's why we say it. <laughs> <laughs> you are. <laughs> but. Yes, that's true. Uh, but the thing is, people have been crying out for long-form information sure. discussion for a long time. And when you watch like mainstream TV, everything is reduced to a three-word soundbite. We even had a few years ago uh, the craziest uh slogan ever two words moving forward was julia gillard's campaign slogan uh two words moving forward uh and then uh malcolm turnbull literally ripped off veep with his campaign slogan uh continuity with change huh continuity with change so this is what we've been reduced to in our television marketing for political landscape and and people had lacked the opportunity to listen to long-form discussion about important subjects. Mm. Uh, and that's why I think Joe Rogan and people like that just completely took off. You know, three hours of in-depth discussion with interesting people, uh, getting into the depth of what they really think about the world. Sure. And so people, everybody, everybody's actually pretty intelligent. Uh, listening to this. I don't know if we'll change it. We'll see. I, I actually run this buff up before we came on air. No, nah. so. <laughs> he's just spitballing here. I'm like, well, this is new. <laughs> like, uh, but the, I mean, the, the point I'm making is that uh, everybody has the attention span necessary to listen to long-form discussion and they mm -hmm. choose this content because mm -hmm. they find value in it yeah. uh, and it's servicing a need that, you know, certainly mainstream media is failing to do. Uh, and, yeah. you know, I've, that's really come through with a lot of the comments we've received recently in the channel mm -hmm. uh, where people are not just... Uh, some people are saying, you know, great video, enjoying it, blah, 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 which is great. It's wonderful to hear that feedback. It's really motivating. Mm. But other people are, are writing like essays and and uh, and really giving their feedback and thoughts. And mm. uh, and I've been doing justice to try and read them all. Uh, we have received a lot of great comments this week, which we'll discuss. Yeah. I will, by the time this video comes out, I will have definitely responded to them. Uh but we have read them, and uh, and thank you for all that all that feedback. Um, yeah, no, it definitely gives food for thought. Yeah, exactly. It does take some time, but I do realize that when you okay, this might sound so. I will link it back, but at the moment I'm learning Chinese, right? And mm -hmm. I realize that I can't multitask, like just having in the background and watching like a Chinese show and then doing something else. Like I actually have to concentrate and like in long forms and maybe reflect, you know, when you're growing up as a child and you're learning all these new things, like you're absorbed in one thing for a long period of time. And that's where you genuinely learn and generally generate your own thoughts. And mm -hmm. I think that's the reason why people are vying for long form content is to learn again, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, and it's been, again, like it's been amazing to – see everybody not just comment like i mean yeah they said a great video which is you know still um yeah please good do to that see. <laughs> yeah it's still good to see but then yeah those people put, put in the time to write absolute like essays and like wow like you know you've actually it's somebody's time right mm. somebody's time has actually put like watch the video and actually reflected and think okay i really want to share this um put my two cents in which is amazing to have be able to create a community like that so definitely thank you so much. And yeah, we definitely will be going into it. Um, but before I begin, I, I like routine. How was your week? <laughs> oh, okay. So we're sticking sticking with the format. <laughs> Why not? Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so what this, what's happened this week? We, we've come out of another mandated mask kind of thing today. So, Mate, I've actually been used to the mask, especially because it's getting colder here. So I'm like, oh, it's like a scarf for the face. And like, <laughs> it is a scarf for the face, but like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Well, I'm looking forward to traveling for the first time since mm. the 
uh, pandemic began. We're not allowed to travel out of the country. The borders are ridiculously slammed shut, even to some Australian citizens, as we saw in India. We can talk about that. Yes. Uh, but uh, I will be traveling across country for a poker series. So I will do, you know, a, like a, a mini vlog while I'm over there to kind of just show off the Gold Coast uh, and and have, you know, a couple of videos to keep it going so so Charlene doesn't get a break. Um, and not. <laughs> well, you play poker, I don't get a break. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll also make a video footage. Uh, so it's been good. There's really, I don't think that much else to report. Um mm. Uh, I've been working on my book, but it's coming along slower than I want. How's the weight loss journey? <laughs> oh, good question. So that's going along well. So for those that uh, haven't seen it, about a month ago, I created a video kind of saying that fat shaming was good and I stand by it. Uh, but I also within that video made a, a commitment to lose 10 kilos within three months. So we're one month in, mm. I'm over four kilos down. So we are on our journey. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean to say that I'm super confident because I've been here before. There's kind of like a threshold where uh, a normal weight range, I guess, you're in. And I'm at the very bottom or perhaps just a bit lower than my normal range over the past few years. Yeah. So uh, there's a, a couple of big milestones I want to hit before mm. I feel like I'm, I'm What's confident. the hardest part of losing weight for you? Uh, food sizes. So I'm portion. someone who, yeah, portion. So I really love to eat food. So the things that I've had to give in up, uh, alcohol. So I've, I've had. Thank all, goodness. Okay. <laughs> Keep going. I've had to have almost no alcohol. Um, yeah, very few drinks over this time. And I have had no sugar. Mm. No sugar is fine. I actually don't like sugar much. Uh, I don't have that much of a sweet tooth. I do like chocolate occasion. I do like the old creme brulee, but but typically I'm I'm not someone who just you know is looking at the dessert menu when I go to restaurants, for example. Yeah. Uh, so that's been okay, but not drinking is is the challenge, particularly in Australia. Um, and but food portions, like you know, I I don't like the feeling of being hungry, mm. uh, and it, because you know, as we discuss, I play a lot of poker which requires a lot of concentration. You really can't be distracted. Uh, being hungry is just a really great recipe for poor performance. Mm. So that's been the hardest bit. Uh, and also restricted feeding. So so certain things that I feel like I can eat a lot of, you know, like skinless chicken breast and things like that, which doesn't have that much calories, you know, lots of green leafy vegetables. Yeah. Uh, but really not that much else. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but so far, it hasn't been too bad. Like, it hasn't been torturous or anything like that. Good. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. And I've you know kept up the exercise and, and all that as well. Mm. Uh, it has been challenging with the lockdowns. Uh, I feel like we are at a point now where it's mentally taxing. I think for the first three, six months, mm. it was fine because, first of all, the pandemic was new it's hugely yeah. disrupting you saw like a lot of interesting things were happening in the world yeah so while it was really traumatic you know it was, it was economically like challenging, <laughs> it was novelty we were all in it together sure uh and there was also a sense that it was finite they were looking at you know three six months six months max you know two weeks flat in the curve all that stuff yeah. uh and now more than a year on mm. to just be snapped back into lockdown is not clear when you still have when you have people like joe biden who's totally vaccinated still wearing a mask on mm. zoom calls right yeah you start to question where does this end at what point does the risk benefit calculus shift in favor of individual liberty and rights yeah at what point does our government relinquish its emergency powers and go back to a parliamentary democracy like they were elected to be a part of. Uh, Do you know the excuse they always say is we don't know? And they don't know. That That's literally been the answer for a lot of the, these questions. Like, we don't know. So we're just going to put public health first, which is fine. But like you said, we still need to make a calculation. Surely, like, we have mathematicians, statisticians to see the level of harm that is done with the economically and education and all these other factors in place. Surely. Well, well the, it's been a, it's 
is it being binary at the moment, right? So they look at the impact of the disease yeah, and they look at economic impact. But there are many other statistics that aren't discussed. For example, uh, in the US, uh, population birth rates have shrunk by like mm. 6% in the last year, okay? Uh, because people aren't having as many babies, because people aren't, you know, planning for the future. They're not yeah. spending enough time together. They're all in lockdowns. So they can't, yeah. you know, make babies. Yeah, well, they uh, can't afford it. Can't afford it. <laughs> Uh, and that's just one thing. Then we had that video months ago, something like 30% of Americans uh, between the ages of 18 and 24 have contemplated suicide in the yeah. last you know, six months. I mean, that's just unbelievable. In any normal year, that sits around 2 3%. Uh, and so this is really dangerous, um, mm. and we could do this for almost every subject. So there are huge costs, and also society is changing. We, we, if you spend too long doing something you become institutionalized uh we, we're developing a kind of a collective stockholm syndrome mm. so i don't mind like dramatic policy changes in response to acute crises like if yeah. we have a world war or something then yes we absolutely need to make sacrifices and change the way we live yeah uh in order to preserve something that's special for the long term yeah uh but these things have to have an end date. You can't mm -hmm. just say, oh, there's a risk and it's not above zero and thus we can't live our lives. Uh, that's that's too dangerous. So we, we initially had the two weeks to flatten the curve, mm -hmm. the idea being that we would uh, slow the rate of infection so that there'd be enough ICU beds and, and uh, ventilators and things for people so that there wouldn't be a spike in mortality because you wouldn't have the hospital system overrun. That was the original plan. Mm. Which makes sense in theory. Of right? course, and it does make sense. You know, if you, as long as people have ICU and ventilators when they need them, yeah. mortality is down like 70 75%. Um, but obviously if they're not available, then, yeah. then people suffer. So that made sense. Um, the problem is, is you keep moving the goalposts, right? You, yeah. And, and then it's gone, like, even when there are no cases, we we want the risk of being cases to be zero. So, uh, yeah. I, I mean, at first there was like, okay, well, if we get a vaccine, then we'll be okay. That was the idea. And yeah. then by some miracle, we got multiple vaccines. And this is... A, not just one, multiple. Not just one. Yeah, exactly. And... Produce all around the world. <laughs> Even Russia's vaccine, the Sputnik vaccine, seems to be working, right? That was the yeah. one that everyone was laughing at, but it actually and, does seem to be effective. And China's vaccine just got approved by WHO. So, again, we have more vaccines than ever. <laughs> yes, although, although WHO might be in China's pocket. Oh, uh, no. but, but anyway, so the... Who isn't? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Good point. Uh, and so we have these, uh, these goalposts yeah. moving, but the vaccine, we locked out with the vaccine... But then there's this whole, like in the US, even if you're vaccinated, you should still be wearing a mask in, you know, mm. if you're by yourself. Uh, it's really quite bizarre mm. the way in which these public health messages have just trumped everything, regardless of the true level of risk or the consideration. But I think they only do that by cover like a blanket rule because it's easier to manage, you know. Do like they though? Do they? Well, like if you have, if you say, oh, in this circumstance you can wear a mask, and that circumstance you can't wear a mask, like it, it's frustrating because, like, yeah, if I, because I have the vaccine and I still have to wear a mask and still, you know, have to follow every guideline, even though I'm fully protected. But then they're like, well, it doesn't mean you can't spread it. I don't know. Like, it's yeah. It's just, and this is the thing: you're getting you're getting to a point where what happens when everyone's had the vaccine. Does that mean that everything opens up as normal? Mm. Or or does the government be like, oh, power? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the, the, there is not, like originally there was a clear end state. Yeah. We would wait, we would flatten the curve. Then when we were controlling the spread, we would open, open up. up. Yeah, gradually. Uh, but now it's like, okay, yes, but there might be uh, in four years' time some kind of mutation of the virus that mm. might make this particular vaccine less effective. Ergo, we all have to wear masks forever. Mm. Um, and that's, it's not clear for people. People have not been given the out. Mm. Uh, it I sounds mean, terrible, but, like, I'm so used to it now. Even though it's kind of more taxing on you, I, 
I'm kind of used to it <laughs> in the way of like, oh, okay, I just accepted it as the new norm <laughs> and move on. Like, and that's dangerous. Yeah, exactly. That's I'm like, dangerous. well, this is like not my liberty anymore. <laughs> like, yeah, and look, none of this is to say that that people aren't doing things in good faith. You know, yeah, obviously this is a serious disease and, and vulnerable groups, you know, need to be helped and supported. Uh, all I'm saying is that there needs to be an irreversible roadmap out of here, okay? Mm. That is... We need to have, you know, etched in blood, carved in stone. Once we have this level of vaccination, these are the freedoms that will be returned. Mm -hmm. uh, the emergency laws will be, you know, revoked at this time. Um, the, these things need to be laid out clearly. But what's happening instead is uh, the most, let's say, hysterical perspective uh, is just dominating the discourse. Mm. Um, and no politician really wants to be the person that exposes people to the disease. Yeah, of course not. Um, so... But historically, is it because, like, other um, viruses that just happen so quickly and it, well, everyone died off? There's a, there's a <laughs> philosophical that... question about... No, I mean, the answer is yes, but there's a philosophical question to be answered here. I think so much of what has driven this is this presupposition that we now dominate nature, that humans have become so powerful mm. that no longer are we, you know, supplicants to these elemental and whimsical gods, yeah, right, yeah. Uh, that can just plague us with locusts whenever. Uh, we now are masters of our fate mm. and thus... I think what has driven this battle against this disease is an assertion of our human mastery, uh, if you like. Yeah. So previous um, generations either didn't understand how the disease spread or if they did understand it, just kind of accepted it as accepted. another yeah. problem. Now they take necessary precautions, but they wouldn't, you know, the, the whole society wouldn't should be shaped by it yeah yeah mm. i mean the, the disease but like you said the disease is kind of like a weird like it's not so it, i mean it's still like terrible but it's like not so terrible because it doesn't affect the young right like doesn't affect not... the young and also <laughs> if you look at india right which is by far and away the most decimated country on earth today yeah. with the disease. You know, half a million cases a day, thousands and thousands of deaths. Well, each day there seems to be about three and a half thousand, four thousand deaths from, from the pandemic. Now that's, okay, a large number, mm. but there's well over a billion people in India. Yeah. And, you know, there would be 10, 20 times that dying from heart disease in the same period, right? So um, maybe not that many. How many was this? We've got one point something yeah it'd be, it'd be pretty pretty high okay um so for that reason mm. um now i'm not saying look you know it is a serious disease yeah, people course. are dying if you're in a vulnerable category you know this could happen so i'm not I'm not sort of dismissing it but this isn't smallpox this isn't the bubonic plague uh this isn't polio this isn't a spanish flu this is a disease that is dangerous for certain groups um, but with appropriate management and care is mostly treatable uh, and uh, mostly able to be fully recovered from and uh, with the vaccination program you're basically mm. guaranteed to be okay yeah. so if you roll out the vaccination to those vulnerable groups yeah. uh, then the risk of death from this disease becomes negligible uh, now I understand that this is a, an area where people of goodwill can disagree. Mm -hmm. um, all I'm saying, all I'm saying is that we need a clear path back to normality. We need to be like, okay, we'll do this and then this and then this. Yeah. Uh, because what seems to be happening is every time something unexpected happens, no matter how trivial, mm -hmm. people are <laughs> jumping to the most extreme reaction of Armageddon. And oh, my gosh. Thing. Yeah, like Australia be like, we'll lock you up if you come from India. <laughs> that was insane. That, like, that just blows my mind. Like, I don't understand who, like, they had to discuss this, right? Like, intelligent people had to discuss this and be like, okay, what do we do about, you know, people from India coming, Australians coming from X country? Yes. Like, it just... 
so what happened was they stopped flights coming in from India because yeah, of which, how much. So which yeah, understandable. That's understandable because yeah. they did it for other countries too. And then when they realised that Australians were coming back via other hubs, so they'd fly from you know India to Doha and then Australia. Yeah. They were saying, okay, well, any Australian that comes to India will get locked up. And that's just, I mean, anyone who says that should be locked up. Absolutely. Um, it, it, Australian citizens, you know, civis Romana sum. We are, we are citizens. The meaning of citizen essentially means free access to our own mm-hmm. lands. Uh, and the government should be safeguarding that right, not infringing that right. Mm-hmm. And as I said in the video... Mm-hmm. The reasons they're feeling like they have to do this are their own fault. I mean, through the great wisdom of our government leaders, Mm -hmm. they're taking arrivals who are infected with the pandemic Mm -hmm. and placing them in the most densely populated areas of our major capital cities and are shocked and amazed when something goes wrong Mm -hmm. and then they shut down the entire metropolis. Like, do you know how big Australia is? (laughs) (laughs) You could have these people literally anywhere for their quarantine. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and have appropriate medical care and everything. And, yeah, and essentially make... guarantee we'll never have to close our cities. And do some math, right? I, I, like most of it is mild symptoms. So do some math on like who would be most at risk and then taste percentage probabilities and create like hospital systems or like enough beds and ventilators for the amount of people that you're accepting into Australia. So you wouldn't be overwhelmed because you kind of have it in your mind. Okay. And then, yeah, just put systems in place. It'd be much cheaper than throwing people in jail. (laughs) Yeah. And and much, much cheaper than shutting down your entire economy. Uh, Yeah. We we could be doing this a lot better. And I mean, the the governments have been adored and praised for the fact that in Australia, the disease is largely suppressed. And that is a pretty amazing achievement when you Mm. think about it. Uh, But... It's not to say that, that the actual outbreaks that are occurring are anyone else's fault but the government's. I mean, having people in densely populated areas yeah. is their fault. Accepting AstraZeneca and knowing the risks of AstraZeneca. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so in Australia, the vaccine rollout is way behind schedule. Now, part of the reason... Oh, do you know what I heard? Yeah. In Darwin, so they have the rollout has been so bad that the Darwin vaccines are getting spa- expiring. So they're having to like speed up the <laughs> rollout. So like I've got family in Darwin and they're like, they're Im- uh, immediately getting their vaccine even though they're not in the thresholds. Mm. But because they're expiring, they're not doing it properly. They're, obviously there is some sort of, it's just a mess. It's just a mess. Oh, okay. <laughs> Compare this to, to the UK. I mean, the UK rollout is amazing. Like that woman oh. that was in charge of it, and she needs she needs a knighthood or dame, whatever the equivalent is. Um, yeah. Because... The whole population has been vaccinated out of the schedule while the EU is fumbling along finger painting. Mm. Uh, now, the government, the Australian government, has blamed the EU for us not getting a vaccine, but this isn't even their fault, right? I mean, it's part of the issue. But as you say, the AstraZeneca vaccine, so at the time that we got our imported vaccine, Canada and a couple of other countries, like-minded countries, had already paused their rollout yeah. because of blood clots. And the Australian government was like, oh, I'll be fine. So they, we got the AstraZeneca vaccine. People got blood clots. The government then had to pause the rollout of that vaccine yeah. and get Pfizer instead. Yeah. Uh, so- then we have a bunch of almost expiring vaccines. Because <laughs> like oh, my, my family oh. had to get jabbed by AstraZeneca because they were yeah. expiring. <laughs> yeah, it's just crazy. And like that's just a waste of resources. And like mm. again, and what I don't like, this is one thing I don't like, is that the messaging from the federal government and the state government are very different from each other. Mm. Like in terms of the vaccine rollout. So the federal government are like, look, you know the risks, whatever, well, like you can choose. Whereas some states are like, we're not um gonna give any of this vaccine to certain populations. Yeah. Which is not what they like it just uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, but ugh, like, okay, I go on about this all the time, but let's move on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, again, and everyone around the world uh, is dealing with this issue uh, in their own own local challenges. Um, if there's anything that's really odd uh, in your local area that you would like us to talk about with this pandemic, like anything unusual that your government has done, that you can just find out, like, because we, we can go on about the Australian government, but there are people around the world with their own uh, little quirks. Mm-hmm. Um, so please share them down below and we'll discuss them. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. So you covered a few mm-hmm. topics and we're back to Lithuania. Well, Lithuania. <laughs> and spoke about Lithuania's identity 
Um, I also coined this after I watched the video. I was like, freedom fighters, you go. <laughs> <laughs> but some of them disagreed. Some of them were saying, you know, to be Lithuanian and identity are different things, you know, and it doesn't really matter. Like, why should a, an outsider need to know what Lithuanian identity is apart from um, being anti-communism? You know, they want to remind the, the rest of the world that communism is a toxic, um, what did they say? How did they say? System? Hmm. Um, and they want to be known for that. Uh, well, there's nothing wrong with, with that. And I, I kind of alluded to that distinction in the video. Also, um, uh, I was reminded that the pronunciation is uh, Nama Yunus. Nama so the, Yunus. The, the, the J, so Rose Nama, I was saying Rose Nama Yunus because I just read the words phonetically. Yeah. Um, but in Lithuanian, the, the J is silent. J is silent. Yeah. So uh, thanks for that. Um, or J is Y. You know, yeah, I think yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So apologies for that. Uh, I'll, you know, I'll do my best, but I mean, I'm an Australian, so I barely speak English. Uh, the, yeah, right. uh, you know, it's a great point. And uh, identity, what I find is that, that you don't want to always be railing against something. That's mm -hmm. the key point, right? If, if you always define yourself in opposition, people will view you as an opposition. And I find this in politics as well. Yeah. Uh, if you are, you know, railing against the Tories or something, you'll yeah. probably lose, just as they did in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same with, with the Russians, if you like. If they're always your kind of your nemesis mm -hmm. uh, and all you are is defining yourself in opposition to, to what they represent then uh, you're, you're incomplete as an identity. However, uh, the point of the video was to show that that actually inverted that. They're for something now. And I really find that something mm. that, that Lithuanians should be proud of, for democracy, for individual liberty, for growth of opportunity, mm. um, for realizing your own potential, yeah. for moral clarity. And, and a lot of the comments we received, and I, I don't think I labored this point enough in the video, was just how profound it is for Lithuania, this country that depends on other economies and trade and, and investment and all of that to grow, to say, sorry, China, but you know, you're a communist dictatorship who's oppressing your own people and no matter how rich you promise to make us, mm -hmm. We're not Can't going to that. deal with a genocidal regime. Mm. And that moral clarity uh, is something that, that is what I associate with Lithuanian identity now. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not like, oh, we're fighting the communists, although that is impractical what is happening. Yeah. But the reason why you're doing that now uh, as a Lithuanian mm -hmm. is less about protecting your own sovereignty, yeah. which is you know important, but more about standing up for Western civilization, enlightenment principles, uh, you know, rule of law, uh, freedom of speech. These are true values that, that, for better or worse, the Lithuanians are becoming the custodians of, and the only ones that are willing to act faithfully yeah. in that respect. So uh, I think and that's It's such a important. small country too. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, but but it, it's, it's critically important because it reminds us of the the choice. Sure. I mean, when we look at, um, and I can talk about Australia's policy for, for a moment towards China, uh, from the around 2000 and onward, uh, Australians got absolutely hooked on Chinese money. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is there was a strong belief that if you traded with China and the Chinese got rich, you would have a begrudging middle class that uh, were no longer living in subsistence agriculture in China. And as they became economically free, they would demand political freedom. It was also thought that democracy was necessary to escape the middle income trap because uh, you needed like open markets, you yeah. know, lack of corruption, transparency, uh, international, you know, rules of, of, of trade in order to continue to develop. Now, China has completely quashed all that right they've mm -hmm. continued to grow economically but they're becoming more authoritarian not less mm -hmm. so this theory that existed particularly in the united states and australia in the early you know in the 90s and the 2000s is completely over like that is not credible at all so now it's a choice if you continue to trade with china you do so knowing that all it does is make the chinese government rich mm-hmm 
and China itself more powerful, but it isn't going to lead to some, you know, Arab Spring in China where everyone becomes democratic and lovely. It didn't even happen in, in the Arab Spring, of course. Uh, and yeah. so you're doing so knowing that you're just enriching this authoritarian regime. Mm -hmm. And the Lithuanians have said, we're not going to make that moral error. We're not going to make that hazard. Uh, whereas Australia and, and the United States and certainly much of the rest of Europe is still kind of locked in that, that conflict. I mean, as someone else made a great point about Germany, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they're all, you know, waving their finger at Russia, but they're still <laughs> accepting that gas pipeline among the Baltic Sea. So uh, it, it, it makes it makes Lithuania special mm -hmm. uh, in that respect. Um, so that's the, the kind of uh, value system that is speaks to Lithuanian identity. But there are other things that I think that that uh, should be iconic Lithuanian. And What's, why is basketball one of the comments of Lithuania? Do you know? Oh yes, yes, yes. I don't talk about basketball. I'm not. I'm not personally okay. So I love Lithuania. What's that? About? I just got to lose some subscribers. I'm sorry, Charlie. I love Lithuania. I'm not a basketball fan, right? But if you're in Lithuania, it is like an obsession. Everyone loves basketball. Okay. okay. Uh, and first of all, the Lithuanians are just crazy good at basketball first of all they're wildly tall i mean you're all you're like all oh, you lithuanians are ridiculously tall okay uh, what's their average height you know like oh i don't know <laughs> like like if I, if I want to feel like a giant i go to like indonesia or something like that if i want to feel like a dwarf i go to lithuania right? <laughs> okay, cool. um, so uh the um so lithuanians are tall so they have a lot of natural advantages. Mm -hmm. But for a country of three million people, three and a half million people, they have like the second best basketball team in the world after the USA. Cool. Right. They're the only country in the world that can really go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the US in, yeah. in a serious way. And and when you're like that small of a country, being that outsized in terms of quality of basketballers is mm. just crazy. That is a, such an astonishing um, uh, athleticism. Mm -hmm. um, that can be associated with this very small number of people. But here's a bit of trivia, and this is something that you Lithuanians probably won't know either. Uh, what is the most successful international sport for Lithuania? Now, reflexively, they'll say basketball. Okay? Yeah. It's not true. It's rugby. Rugby. Okay. Now, this will be really astonishing for Australians as well because they, when they think of uh, rugby countries they do not think Lithuania no, they think, don't. They think uh, New Zealand uh -huh. South Africa yes. uh, Wales England uh, Ireland and Australia uh, they do not think Lithuania but the world record for number of consecutive international wins mm. in any sport is Lithuania Rugby. I love that. 16 consecutive victories <laughs> oh in a row. Uh, it was funny because the All Blacks, New Zealand, was about to break that record. Yeah. Uh, they were on that final match. And uh, the Lithuanian Rugby Association, whatever their name is, called up the Australians because we were playing them in that final match. They're like, please, please don't let the <laughs> New Zealanders break our record. Uh, and the Australians <laughs> held them to a draw. So you are... You owe Australia a debt of thanks for maintaining Lithuania's unbroken international rugby championship record. That so, is well so cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, now, of course, like Lithuania isn't a globally renowned rugby, mm. you know, thing, but they do have that one. Yeah. A little bit of trivia. Huh. Um, What's Lithuanian food like? Because you've been in Lithuania. Like what? Oh, the Zeppelines. Zeppelines. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, like... like uh, potato dumpling type oh, things are quite nice so they're full fully stuffed yeah uh and although i mean chicken kiev i mean kiev is obviously a ukrainian city so i assume it's not from lithuania but they're very common in lithuania um mm. and they're delicious like so think of it like a um like a chicken uh stuffed with garlic and, mm. and broccoli and it's just oh, it's really yeah good. i think we had this conversation i've never had a chicken kiev yeah, she's never had a chicken kiev, which is weird because it's a common thing in Australia. Yeah. Right? But... Um, so we'll, we'll fix that problem in the next next couple of months. Yeah. Um, but are hard to find in Australia. I haven't, I haven't seen any of these. Might have to make them yourself. Mm. Uh, yeah, the, the, so, a lot of great things. And mm. so they've opened up embassy, right? Have they? Have they yes. So 
Lithuania has opened. I think it might have even be last year in Estonia as well. I'll check the others, the Baltic states. But Lithuania has now a permanent mission to Canberra with an ambassador to Australia, mm. uh, which is long overdue. I think that's a fantastic thing. But Australia hasn't had one there yet in Vilnius, so we need to, we need to hurry up with that because um, mm. for very good reasons. And I, I'm a huge advocate for that. Mm. Uh, but Charlene and I will definitely find the ambassador from Lithuania and hopefully do an interview as soon as possible. We are on the, uh, a long way away from Canberra, um, so it's going to be hard for us to, to do that. But maybe when we get to 1,000 subscribers or something like that, mm -hmm. we'll do that as a sort of a special treat. We'll, uh, we'll go in and because I'd love to hear from the, uh, the Lithuanian ambassador to Australia. And in fact, I could actually um, show the ambassador around if they don't already know some of the secret Lithuanian things that are in Canberra. Uh, uh, there are some special Lithuanian little tidbits around the city because Canberra is a very planned city. It looks incredibly drab, mm. right? Like it's it's just such a, a monolithic planned mm. government city, right? Uh, it's pretty, but it's it looks boring, as, as hell, right? <laughs> You're pretty but boring. <laughs> it's beautiful. Like it's a it's not like you know a communist layout. It's beautifully designed. Yeah. Uh, but it is there for the business of government, right? Mm -hmm. It's everything you'd expect from like a Washington style city. Uh, but there are some specifically Lithuanian things around the city, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll do we'll do a little maybe a day tour and, and mm. quiz the ambassador on this stuff if if uh, he or she I think it's a she knows about it where's the the purpose of an ambassador is that just to strengthen relations is that i don't even know what ambassador this is oh wow thing, so. okay so so great question maybe i'll do a video on this it's a it's, it's probably something that a lot of people don't know what does an ambassador actually do yeah uh well in the modern day because this changed over time in the modern day the ambassador has a few different functions number one is to look after the interests of their uh, citizens within that country so if you are um, an Australian citizen and you're in India, mm -hmm. for example, just choosing that out of nowhere, mm -hmm. uh, then the High Commissioner to India, because um, it's a Commonwealth country, uh, is supposed to look after the Australian citizens in that, in that oh, okay. country. Yeah. So, you know, with passport help or if they get into legal trouble or they can provide some general assistance. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's certainly true. Then strengthen relations between governments. So... Uh, if there are investment opportunities, business opportunities mm -hmm. uh, to really promote that in country. So, for example, uh, Lithuania exports condensed milk to Australia, um, uh, which we will discuss. Um, but there might be a range of other Lithuanian products that Australian consumers might uh, benefit from. Mm -hmm. So the the uh, ambassador will look at the market here in Australia and see what kinds of things Australians need, mm -hmm. uh, what Lithuania produces, and whether or not those ties can be strengthened. Mm. Um, certainly, what I would love to do, and I'm, I'm going to get in so much trouble with Charlie because I'm spitballing all these like th ideas on camera, uh, but I would really like for our merch when we finally set up to have Baltic amber, Baltic jewelry so cool. um, as like a dangerous policy kind of merch store, which would require us to import from Lithuania, um, you know, local local products. Mm. Uh, so the ambassador promotes that sort of stuff, makes mm. sure that those trade linkages are the people-to-people -people relationships. So um, certainly tourism to Lithuania. Mm. And, and one incentive for, for example, the ambassador to Lithuania to give us the time of day mm -hmm. is us going around to Australians and say, hey, look, you know, you're going to Europe, everybody does. Um, make sure you go to Lithuania. Don't miss that country because yeah. it is quite a special place. So special, so underrated. Got the best Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Absolutely. so you can have your Insta snaps. Like you're, oh, you're so ready. Yeah. <laughs> and then, the, and then the final uh, responsibility of the ambassador is, is security related. So, sure. um, uh, the ambassador uh, from Lithuania to Australia will have mm -hmm. much to say about obviously Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll be talking about you know what's going on with NATO, um, mm. so Baltic security, yeah. uh, you know Sweden, things like that. Uh, what's happening with the EU? So they they will be able to share insider information that you won't be able to see in the news. Yeah. And Australian government can have uh, confidential discussions with Lithuania via the ambassador. So mm. you know it's it's. 
if you're a prime minister of Australia and you visit the Baltic, well, you're going to have a whole troop of media and coming along with you and all that. And you will have private discussions, but it's very public, right? Yeah, of course. Whereas if you have uh, dinner with the ambassador and they come to your, you know, office, mm-hmm. uh, they're like you, a proxy, right? Yeah, so. you can you can, you're effectively having a conversation with the Lithuanian government mm-hmm. in private able to have those conversations with you know candid exchange of views so sure. ambassador is very important for those reasons uh, people think that ambassadors aren't really important anymore that they're sort of a, a 19th century hang up because you know everything's instant communication worldwide mm-hmm. like once upon a time the only information you would get necessarily would be from the ambassador yeah. uh, whereas now obviously it's all online everything's 24 7 uh but that doesn't mean the ambassador has less to do. It just means that their role description has changed uh, somewhat. Mm, mm. True. Cool. Yes, but oh, fingers crossed. That would be such a cool thing. Good milestone event to, to speak with the Lithuanian ambassador to Australia. And mm. Hopefully we can convince the Australian government to, to do the same and reciprocate. Uh, even if it's only... Because I, at the moment, uh, I think it, our ambassador to Poland is the one that also extends to Lithuania. Yeah. Uh, which I think is inadequate. I think we need one in, in Vilnius. Yeah, that'd be cool. Okay. What else is there? Um, One thing I really want to out like every single week is Meghan Markle and Harry. (laughs) As much as we love Lithuania, I think YouTube also loves Lithuania. um, They also love Meghan Markle and Harry. (laughs) And it's taken over. It's our top viewed video for now from this video on. Yes. Um, Much to my enduring consternation. So thanks, Oprah. Like, I think that's the only thing that picked up, really. Um, But one of the comments stated that, you know, Harry has a right to leave the royal family because he also has liberty. So what's the problem? Uh, Well, that's a true statement in that formulation of words that have been used. But the manner in which he's doing so so yeah, he, what what Harry and Meghan are doing are a massive grift because what's happening? They're going to the United States. Uh, Meghan Markle has elevated her status from you know the extraordinary celebrity on Suits. Yeah, no one ever heard of her uh, to worldwide phenomenon on the basis that they need to escape. The royal family. Now, what exactly are they escaping? Well, when they had that uh, interview with Oprah, they talked about race. Mm. They implied, without making open accusations, that uh, the reason why Archie, their son, wasn't given a title was because he was, you know, a coloured individual, which is totally false utterly absurd he was never entitled to a title anyway yeah wasn't it meant to do with title yeah just yeah just the fact that that that's the way the family structure works yeah uh and that they were escaping a xenophobic and racist family and they did that deliberately they deliberately harmed the royal institution Mm. to set themselves up with a progressive grift in Hollywood, Mm. right? Uh, So it's not like Harry and Meghan were terrified of the limelight, wanted to get away from it all, and went into obscurity. They took the most public option available Mm. to set themselves up, uh, greasing their way on the backs of the British taxpayer by denigrating their their most important uh, cultural institution. Mm. Uh, And then just shortly after that, uh, you know, Prince Philip passed away. Mm. Uh, Of course, this all happened when he was deathly ill, so um, Harry would have known that this was happening uh, and, you know, spat in the face of of Her Majesty the Queen, um, who was going through the trauma of losing her husband after 73 years of marriage. Mm. Uh, so the timing of it, the way in which it was done, yeah, uh, was utterly contemptible and also somewhat tragic because Harry was the most popular royal mm. until Meghan Markle. Like until this all unfolded and even like after they got married, like this didn't 
just fall away all of a sudden. Yeah. Uh, he was the one that everyone loved. And why? Because he was a military veteran. He was attending the Invictus Games, looking after people who had suffered in the horrors and, and, and privations of, of conflict. Uh, he was a wonderful, likeable man for, for charity and, and and could be a real mascot for the for the royal military, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and I think the, the um, British establishment needs that, a royal that can stand in that role of, of military advocate, you know. Mm. Uh, and so he was a popular guy. They saw that he had actually found a niche. So even though he wasn't heir to the throne and was never going to sit as, as king, he would always be given that special A-grade privilege of being a top-level royal mm. uh, because of his attachment to these iconic British institutions that people really value and love and yeah. need, right? Yeah. Uh, so he was doing great. He had really carved it out for himself. And, and now he's off in Los Angeles checking his privilege and talking about white supremacy. Yeah, it really frustrates me. Like I would give more respect to, you know, his li- liberty, to their liberty, if they gave it all up, if they gave their millions of dollars back to the British public, if that because they have inherited a lot of money from obviously Di- Diana's time, mm-hmm. you know, which is all taxpayers' money at the end of the day, right, to some extent, and investments and all that. Yeah, I mean, we don't, we don't know to what extent because Diana... Diana did come from a privileged background. Like she was Diana Spencer, one of the great families of, of England. So I'm sure that some of his wealth just happens to be inherited from yeah. his mother's side. So some of we can't we can't say that. But but, but you need millions of dollars and you oh. like, and to best yeah, throw it and come to the US, fine. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, live your live your life. But then sign up for Netflix <laughs> and like, you know, have all these joint, very public uh, I guess work and to elevate your status like that's I don't understand like do you want to be royal and do you want to have you know be acknowledged or do you not <laughs> no they want all of the benefits and none of the obligations is what they it, want. That's, that's what they want it's really yeah. sad like and it's 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 shameful I guess like because yeah so many people admire the royal family to hold up British values to be you know representing their culture and yeah, like I said in that video a long time ago, was that they turned their back on the British public. Uh, but the royal family has gotten some really good advice lately. Uh, so just the other day, within the last week or so, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, so the the heirs to the throne, uh, goes uh, Queen Elizabeth, then Prince Charles, and then Prince William. So Prince William and his wife Kate have opened a YouTube channel. Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, so go and subscribe to them. I'll leave a link in the description. Uh, it's actually, I mean, it's obvious, like, production value type mm. YouTube channel. They've obviously got expert advice coming in to do it. It's not like they've just hooked it up and done it on their little webcam. <laughs> you mean like this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They didn't go through the process we did. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, it is it is kind of a, a i think a really good step forward it's like okay what is the answer to megan a markle celebrity we'll make make the venerable royal institution also celebrity create mm. a bit of a window into their private lives without you know embarrassing anything yeah uh and make them more relatable um and i think that's actually a, a powerful answer to the harry and megan thing because very soon you're going to find uh, William and Kate are like the people that people are talking about mm. and not Megan and Harry who will ultimately be um, used mostly as a, as a measure of contrast. Mm. Yeah, so go check out their YouTube channel. It's, it's quite fun. Yeah. Mm. Wow. That's, it's like it's so right you're so insulting. But it's, like, well, it's, clever. Wow. it's certainly clever PR. because It's very clever. Uh, and, and also a change of tactic. Like the... There was sort of an evolution with the way in which the British monarchy interacted with the public. Mm. So obviously, go back hundreds of years, they ruled over the British public, yeah. and that's that's a different era. Then you had the sort of pre-radio era, mm-hmm. where it was all about majesty, right? So what you would do, so Queen Victoria, for example, the great the great icon sitting atop of the the great British Empire, the, the largest empire the world had ever seen, the, the empire in which the sun never set. Yeah. And it was all about jubilee. Um, she would, you know, go down the street and sort of wave 
uh, didn't really say much, but it was all in the visuals. You get the photography or you get the artistry or you get the festivities. Um, and it was, it was the majesty could be associated with grandeur. Okay. Mm. Then you had the era of the radio. And for the first time, the common person would hear the monarch with their own voice. Mm. And so they needed a monarch who could speak for them. And that is where the king's speech becomes such yeah. an astonishing moment of world history. Because, yeah, you know, before, like, if, 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 the, if uh, King George had been around just 30 years before, he wouldn't have had to say anything. He could have his stutter. All he would have to do is stand there and look right. the part, right? Yeah. And and literally everything would have been okay. Um, but instead, there he is into the the Second World War, the darkest era of, of Britain's thousand-year history, and he had to stand there and speak for them uh, when he had this terrible stutter and literally had to sing the words, does it in the most beautiful way. So, um, and, and when that's such a great moment of history. And then... Of course, uh, television arrives, mm -hmm. um, and then we had the, the worst aspect of that in the 90s with uh, the paparazzi, yeah. uh, where Diana was just absolutely mm -hmm. hounded, and she was on the cover of every Woman's Day magazine and every Cosmo, mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know was driven ultimately to uh, to this terrible accidental death, um, trying to escape from from that uh, coverage. Did TV create celebrities? Really, like. Uh, I was, think was, movies did. Yeah. Uh, TV, I think, created drama and gossip. Right. Um, okay. So you would have had celebrity in the sense that people could recognize you if you're well, Humphrey Bogart or something like that, you know, sort of the, the pictures. Mm. Uh, but if you, um, or Errol Flynn, um, but if you were uh, in television, because television could be ephemeral. So yeah. a, a movie takes a long time to produce. You write the script, you get all the crews together, you go out and you manufacture it. So it's all one yeah. great story. Whereas television can be whatever's happening today. Yeah. Um, and you can do it live and you can do it like, you know, breaking news sort of thing. And so that created a sense of, of drama and gossip mm -hmm. among the celebrity class because you had these people that everybody knew, mm -hmm. could recognise, and suddenly their private lives became public interest right. um, and uh, and I think it took a long time so I went, we still haven't solved that that problem yeah. um, and what YouTube has done and I think where the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge are onto something I wasn't going to talk about any of this by the way how did I get onto this anyway so sorry I'm just there's a part of my brain that's like I can't believe I'm talking about Meghan Markle <laughs> but thank what, you <laughs> but what has happened is that YouTube has allowed people to, to, let's say, fight back against that. They can broadcast what they want themselves. They can create their own message and narrative. Of course. They create their own media. Publish it. So they don't have an intermediary. They don't rely on a journalist to report the way that they want them to report. Mm -hmm. So yes, now they can go direct. Yeah. And instead of being... Uh, dependent on the intermediary. The intermediary is now dependent on them. So what they'll do is they'll broadcast it on YouTube mm -hmm. and then all these television outlets uh, who have audiences that aren't on YouTube will actually take that YouTube video, show it, and mm -hmm. then give commentary on it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is a really clever step by the royal family and whoever is advising them has is on to something here mm -hmm. because this will um, allow the royal family to control the narrative in a way that they haven't been able to do for the last, you know, 30 years. Mm. Uh, yeah. So that's, um, you know, my view on it. And also, you know, Prince William and uh, Kate uh, both seem much more sympathetic as figures. Um, Kate really does seem like a good royal as well, like she, uh, Kate Milton. So she... Uh, was often thought to be perhaps a bit too common for the royal family. I can't remember what the the rationale was it, but basically you're supposed to marry within a certain thing. Mm. And you know way more than I do about this. <laughs> well, I mean, William William was dating Kate for a long time. Yeah. Before they ever got married, and uh, it was often thought that Kate was, 
and this was a misjudgment by the media that that Kate was like that girl that William would spend his time with until he found the oh. the woman he was going to marry. You know, um, it, it, it was actually kind of a surprise to a lot of people when it was clear that they were going to get married, um, because the question. Was, I don't know if it was asked as candidly as this, but it was always implied, oh, when are the two going to break up? It was that like, when's, when's he actually going to grow up and marry the person that's going to be his, his queen? So you know? rude. Uh, yeah, no, it, it was. Uh, and, but I think it was mostly because um, people didn't have the opportunity, hadn't had the opportunity yet to see Kate in that role. Mm. Uh, and now people, I think, look at Kate as, oh, Her Majesty. Yeah, yeah, she's... You know, proper duchess, mm. clearly um, able to fill the, the guardianship role of the British public mm. uh, and people are quite, I think, grateful um, mm. that William has made such a good choice and with uh, the other contrasts available in the royal family at the moment, uh, that contrast is even more striking. So mm. having their own YouTube channel will allow that family yeah. to um, shine out on their own and also it's a good, uh, finally it's also a good moment because not only does this respond to Meghan and Harry, it's clear that the Queen is, and it's difficult to say, it's clear that the Queen is going to have to start to take a step back. Um, she's well into her 90s. Mm. She's lost the most stalwart supporter she's had. Uh, and she deserves a bit of a break, let's be real, right? And it's definitely time for the younger royals to make their presence felt. Mm -hmm. Not overshadowing her or anything like that. She's still the queen. She's still the one that everybody venerates and loves. She'll still give the Christmas addresses and of all course. that stuff. Um, but uh, it's clear that the other royals need to carry more of the load. And yeah. uh, one of the things that needs to happen is protecting the royal family as, as an institution and its image. Mm -hmm. And those most able to do that are William and Kate, um, for sure. Because Prince Charles is a controversial figure and he's getting on as well. Um, you know, he's well into his 70s. Mm. Uh, so, uh, you know, and he has all the baggage of Diana and all that. Certainly his younger brother can't do it, um, yeah. Prince Andrew. Uh, so it's, this leaves William and Kate to really carry the torch of, of the institution. Mm -hmm. uh, and they can do that through YouTube. I think it's a great idea. Cool. Mm. It's a long-winded answer, but thank you. <laughs> I was talking about the royal family. Well, yeah. I mean, it's... Yeah, it's it's long, but I mean, if people are as interested in this yeah, as you exactly. insist that they are, they are. Um, <laughs> no, then, it, then hopefully they'll they'll appreciate the take. It, it is really interesting. Like I think of all the celebrities to be interested in, because I never understood why people are so fascinated by celebrities. I think being, yeah, fascinated by the royal family is probably I don't know. Of all, I feel like there's a level tier. Like I think at least they are contributing to the culture for British society. So that's yeah. Well, although Queen Elizabeth is Australia's head of state, there is an Australian uh, royal. Uh, another fun the fact. Crown Princess of Denmark is ah. Princess Mary. She's from Hobart in Tasmania. Uh, and uh, she is married to Prince Frederick. I think that's his name. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh and uh, I'll do a, a video on, on her as well at some point because uh, the Danes are quite a fascinating little royal family as well. Cool. Mm. Nice. Any final thoughts, I guess? I'll wrap this up. Uh, my final thoughts, I mean, I'll do more videos on the subject, but something I've noticed in the, the wonk world of, of foreign policy, the debate on Taiwan has reached fever pitch. The question being... Should the United States defend Taiwan or not against mm. China? And on the against side of the argument, they say, first of all, it's not clear that they can. Second, uh, because Taiwan is clearly a special case made up of Mandarin speakers and so forth, it's reincorporation into uh, mainland China doesn't necessarily mean that that America is banning its allies, Japan, Korea, Australia, and so forth. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily undermine their credibility is what I'm saying. Mm. And also that it will likely prevent a war that will otherwise eventually occur. Uh, that, and that it, you know, the United States will maintain in perpetuity its ability to defend its core interests. So Japan, Hawaii, Guam, those sorts of places, because China 
for the foreseeable future, won't be able to challenge the United States dominance in the wider Pacific region. So that's all, that's the against column. The, the four column is they disagree that this will undermine America's credibility because uh, that, that it won't because they say, well, America has promised to defend Taiwan forever. If they suddenly renege on that agreement, they can get away with more time. Um, then it will imply that they can renege on other agreements too. Of course. Uh, it will demonstrate in a material way that the United States is being pushed out. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also thought that once Taiwan becomes part of mainland China, uh, that Taiwan itself will be heavily militarized and that will allow uh, China to project uh, a blue water navy in the Pacific much earlier than it might otherwise be able to do. Mm. Um, and that this uh, will also create a kind of a fortress in the Western Pacific against any kind of attack on mainland China in the future, uh, allowing China to expand into you know, Central Asia and Southeast Asia and so forth uh, in areas where it has a geographic advantage, yeah. essentially keeping America at arm's length in, in the Pacific. Uh, I mean, I don't, I'll, I'll make a video. I don't want to see my final thoughts, you know, my views. Um, clearly, I'm on the American side uh, and I think that, you know, Taiwan uh, you know, should be protected, but, but, uh, but I understand the arguments and the logic of both arguments. Uh, but I, I just want to say that, that war itself is now being talked about in a crazy open way, mm -hmm. in, a, in a way that just a few years ago was always euphemistic and then a few years before that was unthinkable. Yeah. Uh, our own senior uh, defence secretary or future defence secretary, um, I'm not sure if he's been fully appointed yet, uh, Pizzullo, who was former Home Affairs Secretary, is very senior Australian official, uh, was talking openly about the prospect of war between the US and China. Mm. Uh, uh, the uh, defence minister, Peter Dutton, has talked about the prospect of war between the US and China as like a real thing. Mm. So this is happening, people. Like this is, uh, this is a real prospect. And while I am, you know, certainly not a, on the side of the people that think we should abandon Taiwan, I do recognise that the consequence of not abandoning Taiwan is war. Yeah, uh, there is there is not really a third option. Uh, the Americans like to talk about deterring a conflict over Taiwan. That that by being credible and being able to support Taiwan, the Chinese will back away from conflict. Well, think about the timelines here. Uh, Twenty forty nine is the hundredth anniversary of the People's Republic of China. Uh, it will be the hundredth anniversary of Chiang Kai Shek getting over to Taiwan, uh, and the nationalists being um, setting up a government in Taiwan. Yeah. And the Americans sticking the Seventh Fleet in the Taiwan Strait. No Chinese leader in 2049 is going to live in a China where Taiwan is not part of China. Yeah. Uh, they will absolutely go to war to prevent getting to that 100-year mark mm -hmm. without having China being whole from their point of view. Yeah. Uh, so... Bear in mind that that is that is upon us, and we're, and people at the government level are actually further ahead in the conversation than uh, people in the the open media level. Yeah. Um. So just be aware that that is that is the big change that's happening. It won't be the pandemic. It'll it'll be this. This is the main story of the twenty first century. Yeah. Yeah. Happy note. What's my final thoughts? Bill and Melinda are splitting a. Oh um, yeah, divorce. So it really, I don't know. I guess my final thoughts is marriage is changing. The culture of marriage has changed. Like I, from a young age, I always thought marriage was like forever, right? It's a commitment that you make a lifelong commitment, but it's not anymore. And even the older, even generations ahead of me, are breaking up. <laughs> um, especially things that have built entire empires. Um, so a lot yeah. of Microsoft jokes, huh? What, what, a lot of a lot of Microsoft jokes. Oh, okay, yeah. Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> Explaining the divorce. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or, um, or the other one. It's uh, uh, Melinda and Gates uh, suddenly decided that Bill Gates was the most attractive man and uh, and the greatest human being alive as soon as she received the vaccine. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember messaging you as soon as I got the vaccine. Oh, I was like, I love Microsoft. And it's like, <laughs> why? And I'm like, I just love Microsoft. <laughs> yes. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not, 
don't want to go into people's personal lives. I mean, we just talked about the bloody royal family. But, yeah, it's just... it. Well, speaking of the royal family and me... marriage, remember, Queen Elizabeth, Prince Philip, 73 years. Exactly. So it, it can still be for life, even if it's a, a catastrophe. Um, uh, uh, yeah, increasingly divorce rates and everything are just, yeah, you're right. But... Uh, but there are the counter exceptions. There are counter exceptions. And that mm. basically gives me hope, you mm. know. I mean, people are like, oh, I mean, marriage culture has changed, but it doesn't mean that it yeah, doesn't not happen. Mm. So, yeah. Anyway, any questions, any feedback, please leave them down below. Uh, we'd love more questions. I know that, like, everyone has, has given amazing comments, but, like, I want to be able to report more questions on this. <laughs> um, well, we do, we do get some questions, and... Yeah, look, I agree. We, we'd be good to have questions, but but also uh, that doesn't detract at all from the the effort and thoughtfulness of oh, people yeah, putting into their comments. Because um, one thing that has surprised us a great deal is people really putting themselves out there in our community that we've created. Like uh, the the comments are long and thoughtful, uh, mm. and people really show their like emotional input in their commentary. Yeah. So. Exactly, um, so, and we don't delete any of them. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Important one. So, so sometimes comments disappear. That's YouTube. That's not us. Yeah, it's That's absolute YouTube. Um, mm. But yeah. Okay. Well, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. See you next time.